welcome to all the men and women of the West to Dragon Month. I'm Joe, here with me is my co-host Dan. Hello and greetings. The story continues from the evil dragons flying off into the sunset after Takisa says, you my favorite, Tafurian, who goes, yes, that's my mama. Let's face it, there's also something frighteningly Oedipal about these dragons because they're all trying to show off to her. Yeah, but they also, I think, had eggs with her. Well, <laughs> if we're talking about dragons and deities. Different rules apply. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm mythology obsessed. There is a certain element of Oedipus Rex here. The trouble is, though, Oedipus Rex is ultimately a tragic figure. These dragons are ultimately a little pathetic. The evil ones, I mean. Aurora's awesome. Speaking of Aurora, she's dozing about until she senses that, oh, she's the last one left. Whoops. Unlike Takesis, Paladin does not have a conference and does not have to reassure her of his affections. And she doesn't have to worry about being the favorite anymore. Because all the her siblings are dead. Exactly. Oh, well, that sucks. Not that she cares. Yeah, she's rather aloof about it. She basically goes, oh, they're dead. whoop de doo Toodaloo. I don't care. She basically kind of goes, well, good riddance to them. I don't care. I never liked them. Which begs the question, how good is she? Although, that said, she was the one put in charge of all of her eggs and their eggs. Which shows that these other female dragons were deadbeats. That doesn't shine them in the best light. Now, the difference between t how Tachesis and Paladin handled things is that Tachesis decides to take the eggs and keep them in the abyss. Realm is fully formed in the All Saints War, which comes after this. And the thing is, this war, the All Saints War sees a renewal of the conflict that started here and ends here in this short story. Tachesis put her eggs in another realm, fearing for their safety, because she figured, well, what if they get shattered? Paladin left them in the mortal realm, seeing it as mortal and divine should have distance between each other. That said, I also think there's a strategic element. It's bait. Mm -hmm. Nothing better than live bait. And the entirety of the Valley of Paladin is one big death trap. Yeah. Now, Aurora knows this, you and I know this, our listeners know this, and Aurora knows this. Tarkesis and her dragons don't. Mm -hmm. So, because, very, very important to note. Because scouting is not high on priority. Whereas the new baby mama is warned by a griffin that enemies are en route, she's going to be attacked, and she leaves the deer carcass that she hunted in a rather gruesome scene. And I actually like it. There was something animalistic about it, but it's showing us where the dragons are on the food chain and that they are still animals in a way, just as we humans are. Mm-hmm. She needs to feed and hunt. I just was reminded of eagles and lions, or lionesses, considering lions don't really do any hunting. Uh, they got the right thing going. I mean, you leave the hunting to your women, you live off their income, and <laughs> you get worshipped as the king by everyone and your kids. Yeah, I know. I'm mocking this, but in all seriousness, there's something vicious about the hunting scene, but there's also something very attractive and interesting about it. And it does show us the psychology of the dragon. There's a element of, yes, coldness, but there's also a hot-blooded enjoyment of life itself. And that, in a way, life is not safe. It, doing the right thing is not safe. Mm -hmm. And being good is not safe. There's also the circle of life here. The circle of life. This would be back in the 80s before that song came out. What's interesting is that she gets advice from the griffin to beware. I don't know how I feel about the griffin actually speaking. I like my dragons to be able to be sentient and talk. But I don't like my griffins like that. Hippogriffs, griffins, most other fantastical creatures, I kind of take the attitude to let them be animals. Except unicorns, chillings, and dragons should be sentient. And whatnot. Mm -hmm. There are some that I'd probably put in this sentient category, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. The griffin speaking... I found it jarring. I found it a bit like taking a page from Tolkien with the eagle. Okay, you have me there. That's a very fair point. Although, the difference is the eagles, or at least our king, is directly the avatar of Manway, the king of the gods. Aurora gets the, it in her head. Well, time to play in a trap. She gathers together her spells, which... She puts to good use. She doesn't go for super powerful spells so much as key smart ones. She prefers to keep the super powerful spells in reserve. She seems to prefer the Slayer's Zelos 
mindset of little blows. You just use little spells to cause big damage, which that is a marked difference between her and these other dragons. Although one of them does prove himself fairly smart. She takes down Akis with her illusion, as we mentioned last time, casts an illusion spell of her sleeping only for the white dragon to dive bomb into the mountain. Yeah, I had to read that two, three times. Like, wait, he's dead? Yeah, I get that. Wow, that was anticlimactic. Yeah, it says, He was flying at full speed, augmented by the momentum of a steep dive. Even far above, Aurora heard the crunching of vertebrae and the heavy thud of a massive body, already lifeless, smashing down the length of the smooth cliff. Yeah, I had to read that on my first time like three times just because... Just like that? He's, he's dead? Wow, okay, that, that came out of nowhere. That said, the next two don't prove half so foolish a shame after using a diversion to teleport outside where green and black or arkin and coral are busy just circling around the mountain green and blue they're really kind of irrelevant but they're there to give her a badass cool scene they put up a good fight yeah they're not like furian or Akis. It's good to know that the white and red dragons don't basically just surrender, almost. They, yeah. they don't do a great job. And I think it's on the green or blue dragon that she had to use her most powerful attack. Before she teleports, though, she does cast one spell on Fury and knocking all the spells from his mind, erasing his memory of all his magic. What a buffoon. Dragons should have natural resilience to magic. Especially these dragons, which they're essentially primordial dragons. They are. Now, when she slips behind green, Coral, he sees her coming. Now, I made a mistake last time. I said that black had, I think, the gaseous breath and green had the acid one, but it's actually the reverse corrodes her scales with gas. Yeah, with fart breath. But she in turn does the badass thing and just rips into his throat and just disposes of him. Showing that his farts aren't very impressive and are not desired or well liked. Blue, meanwhile, casts an illusion and she nearly crashes into the illusion. While he teleported up above her, showing that he's got some he's got some moves. He puts up probably one of the best fights. Sadly for him, yeah, it's blue that she ends up using her most powerful spell, Power Word Death, and just goes, you're dead. And he shrivels up and dies. Why? She didn't want to use that spell immediately. I would argue it weakened her greatly, though. And she kind of used it too soon. Mm-hmm. Should have saved that for Corrosis. Yes. But she used it against Darken. She ended up having to go back into her lair through a hidden passage on the summit of the mountain, which is pretty cool that she's got hidden routes inside the mountain. I love that. Shows she's preparing for a while. I imagine she's been preparing for centuries for just such a battle. Yeah. Which I wish I could say the same for Takesis' dragons, but they came in so ill-prepared. They should have stayed together. Mm-hmm. As a team, they could have taken Aurora, but the problem is they let themselves get picked off one by one. Essentially, this was not a battle of five on one, but it was a battle of one against one against one five times. And they really didn't come in with a strategy. If we were to put it in D&D sense, the players playing them are amateurs. Yeah. <laughs> the villainous dragons got cocky. They killed four dragons, one each, and they figure, oh, this is just another one. Yeah. The black dragon... He actually got the bright idea of hiding in the shadows, using his dark scales in order to cloak his movement. Which shows how he got his, his dragon, likely through cunning. Mm -hmm. So we have to give him some credit. The trouble is they're near a underground lake and she decides to use her fire breath for, well, to throw some steam up. He pretty much, this gives her the chance to regroup tackle him and get the drop on him and crush his spine so she used his trick against him which she showed she's better at it than him he still nearly got her he probably came the closest unfortunately furion had an opportunity right there to attack her from behind but he wasn't there well he was elsewhere in the cavern and what's worst for aurora in this situation is she is actually dying she's all but lost a wing let me check my notes um, she, yeah, she did lose a wing. She did lose a wing. The only reason she was flying is because of her levitate spell. 
Yeah. You'd think that a dragon is like Levde or whatever, but she decided, well, it could still be useful. She's also in the situation where her scales are falling off her half her body's probably melted or seared or otherwise been bloodied. She's dying. And she still manages to take out Furion, who just goes, well, yeah, but you don't have magic, and she's proven she's smart. She's killed the others. And he gets cocky. He even starts bragging, you'll be mine, my trophy. I'll wear your skills about my neck. And she decides, well, I'm already bone. Dragon statue, anyone? And yeah. She's, she just realizes she can't cast a spell on him, casts it on herself, pinning him underwater until he drowns. And I also think snapping his neck I think. So, like, pu puncturing through his throat. Furion died with a whimper, where at least his brothers died predators. Faith Akis. Even Akis, to an extent, I would argue, did not die as great disgracefully or as quickly. Well, okay, Furion died slowly. At least Akis tried to put up a fight. Yeah, fair. Furion, what, what fight did he put up? I got you. No, got you. Akis, sure, he Dive died. bombed into the mountain. But at least he didn't dive bomb into a lake. Mm-hmm. Because the main thing that Akis contributed was that he used up her illusion spell. Yeah. It forced her to reveal her location and one of the routes into the mountain. The end of the short story is a pretty cool one. Mm -hmm. Centuries pass and you get the eggs that break open. The eggs, there were four of them by each of the five metallic dragons who made it with Taladin, the Platinum Dragon. And the first egg to hatch would be the gold one, and right a few seconds later, it would be the silver one. Paladin observing everything in his dragon form, mm. because of course he came as a dragon, not as a dude. He later ends up taking on the shape of a man. Well, sometimes an elf. And as a man, we all come to know and love him as his band. band. Fabulous. He's always fab. Have you seen the pictures of that beard? Fabulous. But he says to Orokin, the gold dragon, I named the Orokin. And then he gives the name Darlington to the silver dragon. And thus, dragons of metal and goodness were born again to Kryn. I really like the end. Yes. And both dragons would have an important role to play in the second dragon's war. The thing is, the first dragon's war, or all dragon's war, ends with Aurora sacrificing herself to destroy Furian. And what's really fascinating about it is that she gave no indication that she'd almost be willing to before. So you had this kind of element of character development as she, as she's fighting, she's getting more and more protective of the eggs. Mm -hmm. Like, at the beginning of the story, she kind of regards them almost with a clinical eye. Eh, this doesn't really have much to do with me. But then by the end of the story, she's regarding them with a great deal of affection and they're her babies mm -hmm. so you did get character development there over the course of this short story if subtly so the language used shifts and the tone shifts from one of indifference towards the eggs to one of a very great deal of panic mm -hmm. at the thought of them being in danger so it's a very it, fascinating it, shift it, this entire battle and her injuries the eggs gave her reason to continue because if she was just injured and it's like she didn't care about the eggs then why not just ditch the eggs and go alone but, but no she saved them she sacrificed herself for them which shows there was a hero's heart in there underneath the coldness that she showed to basically everyone and everything at the beginning so there was a shift in her temperament and her views from one a 360 change i called she fundamentally changed as a dragon <laughs> can't say person now we've discussed the battle which is a pretty good battle yeah now it deals with spells that are obviously taken from D, &D but there is a very majestic air about it and there's a sense of scale and scope about this battle Kryn is still primordial in this age and these are primordial dragons and you get a sense of creatures that are almost unmatched throughout the history of dragon lights almost mm -hmm. Not quite. I'd argue Cyan Bloodbane might be even more majestic and mighty than these creatures, and even more dangerous and evil. But Furian, Furian is almost, in personality in some ways, a prototypical Cyan. But I'd argue maybe Corozis might be the direct spiritual ancestor in a way to Cyan, or spiritual successor, because this story, I think, well, this story came out after the Chronicles. Chronologically, he's a spiritual predecessor to Cyan, because Cyan Bloodbane truly epitomizes a great deal of the evil dragon archetype. Mm -hmm. Corozis is the most brilliant of these dragons. I know some people might say, no, Furion is the best of the evil dragons, but I argue 
Rosas. He uses his cunning a lot better. He uses his surroundings. He uses his scales, coloration better. Sure, he doesn't use spells. He doesn't know as many as Furry and Aurora, but he does know enough. I mm -hmm. get the sense that Paladin taught each of his five dragons the same amount of spells. It's just a matter that Aurora put them to the best use. Mm -hmm. She knew her way around the mountain. She memorized everything, and she focused on her wits rather than her bronze. That's what contrasts her from Furion. Yeah, Furion was almost laughable in how quick he went down. Mm -hmm. And that covers the battle, ladies and gents. Next time, we'll be discussing the characters and the ramifications of this war in the larger scale of things. Until then... Oh, and the themes. Oh, of course. Of, we can't forget that. Yeah, of the story. So, if you enjoyed this video, smash that subscribe button, like 